Hey everyone, glad to be here at CSVConf again. So I want to talk today about how during the first year of the pandemic, we implemented a way for people to use their wearables to detect potentially if they have an infection and more importantly, how we build something together to make this happen. I'm the director of research for the Open Humans Foundation, which helps people using and gathering their own data to learn from it, and also a research fellow at the Center of Research and Interdisciplinarity here in Paris. And let's start by the things that wearables can do. So there's a lot of them, and they have increasingly been more clever in what they can actually track. Of course, they can track your resting heart rate. Many of them now do your body temperature as well, your respiratory rate, your sleep duration and quality, and interestingly coming out during the last year particularly a lot of them measure your oxygen saturation as well and that's already a lot of physiological data that you can collect about yourself so even before the pandemic hit last year there was interest in using this for actually monitoring infections and here's a paper that was presented at the conference i think in 2019 that used wearables on a population level to surveil the uh, influenza outbreaks and that was based on data from 2017 2018 flu, flu seasons using i think around 3000 participants and the metrics tracked through wearables were things like the sleep amount of steps taken sleep quality and for some of those variables as like shown here for the total number of steps walked people already st behaved or started to behave differently one to two days before symptoms had any onset noticeably by the individuals. But the limitation, of course, here is that all of this is done on a population-wide surveillance level, not for the individual use. So on average, actually, it turns out that you might see a difference before, so you can see when the numbers rise up. But it's not for making individual predictions. But of course, population-wide monitoring is pretty cool and interesting. And then, of course, last year hit, and particularly in March 2020, where all of a sudden everyone wanted to do similar things, but for COVID. So at the UCSF and UCSD, they collaborated with the people who make the Ura Ring wearable device. They're also at the Scripps Research Institute in San Diego, they started their own wearable data collection, and also the Healthcare Innovation Lab at Stanford did the same. And last but not least, even the German equivalent to the CDC started its own COVID data donation app to address the same, same thing. So all of these came out and they all had pretty much the same approach as the earlier influencer approach I showed you. It was about getting population level data to have like a population wide monitoring thing. And there are some other issues as well, because if you have academic research combined with wearables, then you can easily end up having like some science by press release. And here's just some small quote from one publication, or not even publication, a press release that came out saying that, oh, we can actually have a 90% accuracy in anticipating symptoms up to three days in advance. But they never actually published it. And by now, even the press release has disappeared from the university's website. So oops, maybe not really. But besides this, there's other issues. So there's no feedback for the participants, there's no data sharing, so no one can actually reuse it. And there's definitely no idea of supporting individuals in learning and making sense of their own data, which is what we are particularly interested in. So how can we use wearables for personal science to do this together? But first, what's personal science? Personal science describes people using empirical methods to answer personal questions. And here are some examples. Like, if I'm a diabetic, is this fiber really indigestible and or will it raise my blood sugar? What is triggering my arrhythmias? Or does my transitional hormone therapy influence my mood? So all of these are questions people ask. And actually, last year, just before the pandemic really started getting going with Open Humans and the Quantified Self, we started a project called the Keating Memorial to support people doing personal science collectively together. And this was, as the name implies, in honor of Stephen Keating. Stephen, who was a board member of the Open Humans Foundation, passed away a year earlier because of a brain tumor in 2019. And since he was first diagnosed with it, he became a very keen personal scientist and also data donation advocate. He collected a ton of data about himself, his own genome, his cancer genome, an over 10 hour recording of his awake brain surgery, which he shared. And he believed that data could be useful and should be shared if possible. And he reminded us that collecting this data doesn't need to be selfish, but that it can be used for a greater good if we share data with others and use it collectively. So we just started doing this memorial, which included doing weekly calls where people 
try to answer their own personal questions. And the three examples I gave on the last slide actually were projects people worked on. But then, of course, the pandemic hit and people lost all time and motivation to work on these topics and instead had actually one larger global question, which is, we all have these wearables and can we use them to see when we are having an infection and to make sense of the data and maybe even use this data if we figured out how our personal body responds to having an infection on a physiological level to use it going forward. So collectively, we started brainstorming during the calls and continued in Slack conversations to see how we could do this. And as the first prototype we made for quantified flu, we made one for doing retrospective investigations of physiological signals. So thanks to the infrastructure we already had in place with Open Humans, we already had support for two wearables for this Fitbits and also the Aura rings. So we could very easily make a retrospective analysis that people could make themselves. So people would just punch in when they remembered when they fell sick for the last time, and they would get such a nice graph as on the right side where you can just see in this case how the heart rate evolves over time around the, the line of where you actually noticed falling sick. And this is an example of my own data because I remembered falling sick of all times on New Year's Eve 2018. And yeah, you can indeed see my heart rate already starts going up just a few days before I actually came down with something. So we made a couple of those and actually started doing like a very small scale data analysis on the N of six, where we collectively wanted to see if we can also see the same signal overall. And it turns out for the temperature and also the heart rate, there seems to be at least some kind of signal, which is really nice. But of course, that's not super ideal because first of all, you need to remember when you fell sick in the past, if you want to make sense of this. And that's really hard. You can go back maybe to your calendar or to your chat messages and try to find out when you told someone you were falling sick, but it's not really easy to do. And of course, you might want to track more specific symptoms instead of just knowing, did I fall sick on a given date? Yes or no. And also the continuous monitoring in general would be just much more useful. So collectively, our community decided to learn from the best and steal. So we went to the academic efforts that were launched at the same time and were like, so what kind of symptoms are these studies actually trying to track? And we started just remixing their symptom reports to unify them into one that seemed most useful to our participants. So which symptoms and on which scale should they be tracked? Instead of just having binary symptom reports, we settled for all of these symptoms on a five scale reporting. And people would get daily email check-ins to say, hey, are you feeling sick today? Yes or no? And if no, you are basically done. You just click a link that says, I'm feeling OK. And if you are sick, you are getting taken to this form where you can just move the sliders around and you collect this data, which is nice. It's easy to collect. But then how do you make sense of the data? or How do you use it? So again, collectively, some brainstorming of how could this data be visualized. And we came up with this graph, which converts the data that you provide both in terms of symptom tracking and your physiological data into one graph. In the heat map on the top, you see when you had symptoms and how severe they were over time. In the middle, in green, you have like this commenting section because people can even write comments. And below, you can see your heart rate, body temperature, respiratory rate, whichever things your variable tracks that you can actually use for this. So that's really nice and like the, you can see it easily and can see when you are having like an elevated heart rate because the different gray backgrounds show the first and second standard deviation of the normal medium value of your heart rate. So you can see if you have an elevated heart rate right now compared to what's normal for you personally instead of having to rely on some population approach. And I think what's most interesting for this particular view actually is that there's a lot of value in you collecting data about yourself, which academic studies would never actually collect. And the comment here is that the person reports that, oh, my cough actually, it's not related. I report having cough symptoms, but it's not related to having an infection because, well, I've been smoking more since I'm now out of work. And like a couple of comments earlier, the person says that they were just, that they just lost their job because of the pandemic. So, okay, there is now a pandemic related cough, but actually it's just from smoking at home because they are not going to work any longer. So this data gets collected by people. They can use it for make sense out of it by themselves. And also people can share the data. So people can opt in and say, I want to make this data available for all the other members of the community and basically everyone. So if you want, you can go to quantifiedflu.org and get all the data, both in JSON and of course, as we are a CSV conf, you can also download CSVs of all the data, which are the physiological signals and the symptoms people report. 
So that's the technical implementation on like the very rough level. But I think what's really important to us is that this was not done by me or any of the other individuals who might somehow do this professionally, but really by the community for the community. All of this development was done by the community members of Open Humans and the Quantified Self, and even just random people who ran into our Slack and said, I want to help. So this included the initial ideation and the protocol design, iterating the protocol over time, implementing of the tool and different things uh, like new wearable support, and also testing the implementation, of course. And as we can see, what we did is we just coded every single Slack message into different categories, whether it's about prototyping, coming up with general ideas, or even like the implementation of the prototypes. And we can see that there's a very nice iterative development going on. So after an initial release very early on, there's a lot of renewed interest in discussing the protocol and prototyping more, which leads to a new version of the prototype and so on. And that's really nice because as like many of the things I showed you were not completely just done by any individual person, but collectively. So the symptom tracking or which symptoms to track, I said, was done collectively. The visualization was brainstormed collectively and then one, one master student actually implemented it. And we even had a completely random mobile developer who made an iOS app to get heart rate data out of Apple Watches because we had no mobile developer actually in the community. So someone found us and was like, oh yeah, I'm willing to donate a bit of time to actually help you do it. So besides this all being really cool, what's the benefit of doing co-creation? And what we see is that co-creation really improves the user fit. If you think about how mobile health applications typically work and how much they are being used, one can see in the academic literature that there is a really limited sustained use. In the most extreme cases, less than 2% of users ever return after using your app once and never provide data or get any use out of it. And in contrast, what we see looking at our usage numbers is that we have over 50% of our users have collected data for more than three months. And actually to this day, data is still being collected by our community and people are contributing. So there's a big, big benefit in doing it like this. Of course, if you are an academic, this iterative design is really problematic from an ethical oversight point of view. Because typically if you want to get institutional review board approval for your study, then you need to completely tell them what the protocol is. So there's no way of iterating rapidly and doing things differently. And I think there's like a very interesting case to be made why actually this is a big issue. If you would have done it in a way of getting IRB approval for every single point along the way, we still wouldn't even have the first prototype most likely. And instead we had five, maybe six different prototypes which evolved over time in a span of maybe three months, which is fine if you are doing it outside academia. If you are into academic publishing, that's unfortunately a really big limitation. And I think we need to find new ways for actually doing things together. So to sum up what we learned to give a bit of time back is that first of all, quantified flu, it's not epidemiology, but it's about generating personal insights and personal learning and making sense of your own data. And if you want to try it, you can go to quantifiedflu.org right now, connect your wearable device, start recording your data, and in a few days you can see how your heart rate and so on evolve over time and see if there's any correlation. And I think importantly, we see that this co-creation approach and this community involvement leads to a really high fit to the user needs, which leads in turn to a great continued user engagement. And of course, the data, you can opt into making it publicly available. And there's, I think, 50, 60 data sets publicly available, which you can play around with if you want. And as I speak so much of the community, we had a lot of people involved. So besides me, Matt, Gary, Kate, and Many others were involved in the initial brainstorming and thinking about the project. Enrique helped us a lot in getting the, all the Slack messages coded to actually understand how we co-created. Basil was instrumental in making the heat map. Lukasz from Poland was our iOS developer. Carolina made the Garmin variables and Google Fit integrations. Constantine helped getting the Fitbit support up and running for intraday data. And Ilona and Melvin supported us in making all the, the visualizations for the collective data. And of course, there's over 200 users now who actually tried it out. And please give it a try. And before I wrap it up, I just want to 
take 30 seconds to pitch some similar idea where we could need your support where we are currently crowdfunding. Clara, a student in our lab, is launching a really cool transgender health related project called the Transbiome, which is about the idea that, of course, the, the cis woman's vaginal flora is quite well understood. There's a ton of studies on this. We know a lot about how it's involved in infections and the risk for cancer and all of this. But in comparison, I think there is less than a handful of studies for the microbi microbial flora of the neovagina of trans women, which is highly problematic because it means they cannot get gynecological care. So what Clara has designed is a community driven study, which actually was designed by her as a trans woman with support of the trans community here in France in particular, to collect data on the microbial diversity and to understand even what's the baseline picture, because even that's unknown right now. And if you can help us out with just a few dollars to push us over the goal, that would be much appreciated. So thanks so much and happy to take any questions. <clears throat> Thank you so much for, okay. for the presentation. Um, I think we have a moment, uh, a few moments for a, a question or two, if there's any in the chat. And if there's not, uh, I would uh, invite people. Oh, looks like we have a question. Uh, so can we differentiate between co-creating and the pandemic, pandemic conditions? Um, <clears throat> uh, the so, participation rate, sorry. Right, yeah. So with regard to the participation rates, it's hard to say right now, but we do know that there are all the academic studies which are going on right now, which don't have the, the benefit of being co-created because they were done completely in an academic framework and the academic researchers set up the design and ran it. So once their data is out, or at least the papers are out, we can see how much participants they enrolled initially and for how many they got enough data in comparison. And it's both pandemic related. So we can hopefully make a comparison of that in the future. And uh, I think that's unfortunately, that's all the t uh, time we have for questions. But I invite everyone to continue the conversation in the Slack channel, um, uh, CSV6 Q&A. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>